We're gonna switch gears a little bit because I'm gonna show you some horrific things. However, the purpose of doing so is gonna hit on some life lessons I've picked up throughout my career to ensure that every day is a great day in clinic, uh, but also ensures that you get through that day, you take care of your patients, uh, and do so in a way that is meaningful and certainly impactful. So I have four kind of Yoda-esque life lessons for you. Um, some will spend a little more time than others, but I think these would apply to anyone in this room regardless of what you do, what type of patient you see, where you practice in the world. So I hope that these lessons or kind of experiences are meaningful and, and kind of add something to your day to day. So first off, stay calm when crazy. One of the amazing things about dermatology is that we can see the horror, right? Like people wear, don't wear diabetes, they don't wear hypertension, they can have skin findings associated with those, but the 3,000 plus diseases we take care of, you see them and they could be extraordinarily uh, impactful. So for example, when your medical assistant comes to you and says, oh, patient with a skin tag wants to discuss removal, you're like, oh my God, my day's been crazy. Thank God something simple, I'm gonna walk in, snip or cry that off and move on with my day. <laughs> God, <laughs> what on earth? It's not Rosh Hashanah. What is this shofar doing here? I, I love that Brad cracked up at that one. <laughs> Let's look at this closer. So, so a little more history that I learned after walking into the room. Now, thank God it was on the back and the patient was facing away from me. This was pre-masking, so my facial expression was there. This had been there for 20 years. Fallen off, grows again, falls off. So she's like, yeah, I have a skin tag, can you take it off? And I'm like, sure, give me one second. Walk out of the room and I'm like, Okay, what are we gonna do? This is not gonna fit in a formula bottle. Tell all my residents, run down the street to Walgreens, buy a giant Tupperware. We start pouring out all the formula into that big Tupperware. Go back in, you see that little tiny base? Snipped it, the thing came off, put it in, shipped it off. Patient was fine, never, never, never came back actually. Um, and thankfully, this was not a squamous cell carcinoma, which I imagine many of you were thinking given the intensity of that cutaneous horn, it was just a ward. But I think this is a great example of you walk into a room with certain expectations and they slap you in the face. So always go in expecting the unexpected. I have a rash. Sure, dermatology makes sense. What on earth is going on here? Ugh, God, what is causing this? Now you see all these kind of geometric erosions scattered throughout the arms. I'll tell you, this was all over the place. But I think that that word geometric is so important that you see these kind of jagged, you know, kind of weirdly shaped erosions and ulcers, which should suggest that this is coming from the outside. Now, of course, the patient is telling you, Yes, I have bugs in my skin, I have, I have infestation, uh, but really this is resulting from a neuropathy where the patient feels formication, which is that kind of crawling sensation on the skin, and she is creating all of this. And these patients will do very well with either A, treating underlying disease, driving that paritis neuropathy, and B, also using drugs like I mentioned in my first lecture, like gabapentinoids, mirtazapine, uh, sometimes even pimazide, uh, which can be a very useful tool, especially at lower doses. Here's another one. I have a rash and, oh doc, you know, he's blind and doesn't know why. Like how did that even come up in conversation? But great job eliciting a history, my studious MA. So here's our patient. Yep, he's got no eyes. He also has these dermal kind of flesh colored, maybe hypopigmented, in some areas hyperpigmented plaques along his neck, his brow in a seborrheic distribution. There's no surface change already. You're starting to think about something dermal and possibly something inflammatory. And then in putting this together, obviously you need a biopsy for something dermal, no question, but also the, his loss of eyes. The highest thing on my differential was sarcoidosis and he had infiltration of his eyes resulting in nucleation. And that's what this was. My barber cut me. Yeah, that happens. I've got a nick here or there. My barber cut me, patient coming in for wound care. Love doing some wound care. <sighs> what a haboob. That's a dust, crazy dust storm that we all experienced last night in case you were wondering why I said haboob. Um, yeah, my barber cut me. Uh, first off, you better have a great lawyer. Um, <laughs> 
Second of all, not a barber cut. This was a massive rodent ulcer. This patient had a giant basal cell carcinoma that he only came in because it started to smell. That's what bothered him. And he did wonderfully with a small molecule inhibitor of his Motajib. And here what you're seeing is the closure of that wound and doing kind of sentinel biopsies to make sure that all tumor has been melted away. Also, what you notice in this picture, which this patient was very unhappy about, is that one of the almost expected side effects is alopecia. Because to cycle back into the antigen phase, you need sonic hedgehog. So these patients without fail will develop alopecia, and that really upset him because his, his wife really loved his luscious hair, and it was affecting their personal life, which I know that sounds kind of crazy, but that was impactful to the patient. He didn't want to stay on drug, so we had to put him on alternate day dosing, ultimately alternate month dosing to keep him on it. I have warts. We do this all the time, of course, Veruca, Bulgaris, Plantaris, certainly. Those look warty, but there's a lot more going on than just warts. This patient has blastolinear hypo and hyperpigmentation, um, has areas of prominent atrophy, and you can even see on the upper arm, there's some yellowing there, which when you look at obviously morphology, colors, patterns, distributions, colors can be very telling. And so when we see yellow, we think about lipid. And off the bat, looking at this patient, seeing that, which inferred to me, maybe there's some high-riding adipose, high-riding fat, uh, I was thinking about this patient having focal dermal hypoplasia, genodermatosis. Then, of course, we start chatting, and she's like, oh, yeah, my kids have it too. I have wet fingers that were surgically separated. And I'm like, and you felt that the warts were really what we had to talk about. And those are actually the raspberry papillomas of Gold syndrome. They're not actually warts. They're part of the syndromic picture. The other kind of part of staying calm when crazy is the crazy patients. And the reality is you can't hide from them, they're there. And I think that there are kind of multiple phenotypes. There's not just one size fits all difficult patient. There's the patient who comes to you saying, you're the eighth dermatologist or dermatology PA or NP that I've seen, I know you are gonna figure this out. No pressure whatsoever. There's the patient who is lovely, really pleasant, does everything you say, but they want to tell you about the movie they saw on Netflix last night for 40 minutes. There's the patient who knows better than you because they know how to use a search engine. As not even the fact that they know what you know, but they know even more, and they could do it better than you, or that someone else can do it better than you, yet why are they here with you? There's the threatener. There's the one who will say to you, I'm gonna post a bad Yelp review if you do not do X, Y, and Z. I swear to God, that happened to me. I got a letter from a patient that said, if I could not get a PA for this patient's biologic, she would post a negative Yelp review about me, because that's really up to me. There's also the scapegoater. There's the one who says, it's everything else. Uh, it's not even what you're saying. A great example of this was a patient uh, that came in with his, with his wife, his partner, uh, and had extraordinary genital warts. And the first thing out of his mouth was, it was that damn dirty cement. Yeah, that's an, we have an epidemic of dirty cement out there. So, uh, you know, there, there's patients who want to blame everything else. They don't want to really, they, for whatever reason, they don't want to hear the truth. And you have to kind of navigate around that. There's the fair weather patient, which I think this is a very important one. The one who is so rude to your staff, but then is all sunshine for you. Wow, I got such a great response on that one. Unacceptable. You need to sh a show of good faith to your staff because if they think you're going to side with that root patient over them, you've lost them, you know, whether by EMR message or even in front of them. And one thing I do to set that tone, I co constantly thank and acknowledge my staff in the room with the patient. Whatever they did, thank you for doing this. Like, great job setting up. If it's numbing up for a biopsy, I'll say, there's no chance you're going to feel a thing because she's amazing at this. That's a very easy way to show that there's equal footing here, that everyone's important on the team, and also standing up for them when they, they speak out against or they're rude to your staff. And then there's the haggler who haggles you over, you know, pricing, the length of appointments, or they want three appointments back to back to cover everything. So I, I think there are a lot of different things to consider when it comes to these difficult patients. I think it's always helpful to apologize when necessary, but also take a step back and, and be curious as to why this phenotype exists. Why does this person behave this way? And that might help navigate a little bit more. I don't have perfect answers for any of these, but I think we need to be prepared for these phenotypes so that at least we have some scripting in our head of how to handle them. 
Okay, number two, bite back. What I mean by this is push back when something doesn't jive and something doesn't really feel right. So this patient came to me from another academic institution with a six-year-old wound that just would not close. Hyperbaric oxygen, aplograph, you name it. So what I'm suggesting here is don't just go with the flow and say, okay, we have a non-healing wound. Say, all right, let's take a step back. Why would a patient have a non-healing wound when everything that is used for a non-healing wound would not work? This was a basal cell that had been allowed to grow and grow and grow. And so once it was treated as a basal cell, it got better. Here's another one, patient with recurrent dermal pink plaques on the face. Biopsy came back, spongiotic dermatitis. This is just eczema. There's no epidermal change whatsoever. Never has been, never will be. Didn't even really itch. So call the pathologist, showed the photos, and I said, you know, this doesn't really fit. You know, I'm looking in your description of the dermis. There's some perianexal inflammation, a little mucin. Could this be tumen lupus? Oh yeah, sure, yeah. And, and, and could the spongiotic dermatitis could be from rubbing? Oh yeah, sure, that's possible. Change the diagnosis. So don't just go with the flow yet again. Don't just simply acquiesce to the derm pathology because they may not have seen what it looks like on the patient. Go with your gut. You know better than anyone outside of that room what's likely going on with the patient. My acne never goes away. It's been given, you know, topical retinoids, oral tetracyclines. And what stands out to me here when I walked in the room, I'm like, you know, it's really monomorphic. You know, acne comes in stages, but it's all these small little papulopustules. And this is a great example of how we can use simple tools to get to the answer. Oh, hello there, Demodex, my old friend. So this was Demodex dermatitis, treated this patient appropriately with ivermectin, and it went away. My eczema is not getting better. This is a very nice kind of segue from the original talk earlier this morning about looking at things that can look like eczema, but making sure your differential is broad. Now this patient had a long-standing history of eczema, but if you notice here, there's this kind of squiggly unique scale either at or trailing the border of this plaque. There are papules with little collarettes of scale, and I'm sure you figure out where I'm going with this. This is tinea incognito. Patients been applying clobetazole for weeks on end, just like that, atop, that uh, allergic contact dermatitis case, florid with dermatophyte. I am so itchy and nothing helps my eczema. Okay, we hear that all the time. Interesting. Okay, I, I get maybe why this is called eczema atopic derm, flexural areas. But what's kind of unique here is one, I don't see a lot of scaling. Two, it seems very wrinkled. There's a lot of atrophy here. There's hypo and hyperpigmentation, which you can see once again in atopic dermatitis. But that goes to go back to the drawing board when something doesn't make sense. This patient's being treated like atopic derm and not getting better. And look at all that wrinkling as well. And so if I've been priming what the diagnosis is, looking at this histology especially, you see, you know, exocytosis without the spongiosis, which is kind of pathognomonic for CTCL. And that's what this patient had, being managed as atopic derm, but always had CTCL. All right, getting creative. This is by far, I think, the most important lesson because we have so many opportunities to get creative and have fun because our focus is not so much, here's a drug, this is what it do, stay in your lane, hell no. We go so far out of our lanes. We are the off-label bandits. And it's wonderful that we are because we have so many diseases that have no drugs indicated for them. And so I got this referral from NIH, this 50-year-old man, itchy rash, painful tongue lesion for many years, uh, referred from Johns Hopkins, uh, was about to start immunosuppressive therapy, then oops, strongyloidiasis, so never happened, and kind of fell through the cracks. And so these were the photos I was sent, this really impressive lingual ulcer, this really hyperkeratotic, very confluent, yet well demarcated, pink to almost violaceous plaque on the back. These kind of juicy, crusted, well-defined violaceous plaques, some of them with hemorrhagic crusts on the arms, on the hands. And yeah, it kind of looked like that when he came into my office. So I think the lighting a little bit better here, but clearly still the same thing. And what was really unique about this is because of the involvement of the hands, he couldn't work, he, couldn't, he could not bend even this much of his hands due to the involvement there. And so I'm looking at this, I'm like, wow, this is a, some crazy case. My differential was pretty broad. They called it lichen planus. I'm like, if this is lichen planus, this is the worst case I've ever seen. So I'm thinking all over the place, autoimmune blistering diseases, um, you know, possibly gammopathies associated with intracorneal pustulosis. 
Um, all labs were, uh, were, were normal and the histo fit, you know, but I pushed. I did three biopsies, even a tongue biopsy, because I was not convinced. That goes to that bite back. And then after enough biopsies, I'm like, all right, fine. This is really, 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 really horrific, like in Planus. So how did I treat him? So I hit him hard with high dose oral steroids, started to titrate in methotrexate. Now at the time, we didn't have that lovely paper showing that it's okay to start patients on a higher dose of methotrexate versus that kind of starter dose of seven and a half. So I probably would have started him at 12 and a half versus seven and a half had I had that information. You know, super potent topical steroid, titrate up very quickly, switch things up a little bit. I'm like, all right, we're not getting where we need to be. Let's throw in a biologic. So I treat him with ustekinumab, kept going, started to pull back on the methotrexate, and I really wanted to get him off prednisone because he was having some side effects associated with it. And this is where we got him. And so this is not a 100% win, but definitely a step in a very right direction. Um, and so we've been able to get him to a mild to moderate state where he can work, he can cook, which he likes to do. Uh, he likes to cook for his family but he still has some disease. And so we're still playing around, especially with all the new toys that we have before us. So I really encourage, be creative, get off label, um, because I think that there's a lot of opportunity to help our patients, even though it may not really be within the lines. Another example, 42 year old patient, longstanding, really bad familial pemphigus. So Haley, Haley disease, treated with all the typical things you'd think of. Really, she was about to give up. And we know that sweat really can contribute to the severity of disease, that sweat can cause more maceration and shearing forces that rip apart the epidermis. And so I was like, well, why don't we knock that sweat out? Let's do on a botulinum toxin. And so she's actually doing really well on monotherapy every four months, 50 units per axilla. And there's actually some, some data and, and studies or case series in the, in the literature to support this. I've also used oral glycopyrrolate, which is dirt cheap. So when you're thinking about access to care, uh, this is super easy to get for patients, literally pennies on a dollar. What about lichen amyloidosis? Ren Oman was, is, uh, is the program director at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, was one of my teachers, and, and he talked about the too much itch sign, that these patients without fail, when they come in, they say too much itch, because this is extraordinarily paritic disease, and that paritis actually drives a lot of those changes you're seeing. Gotta get creative. I use topical tazeratine and eczema, for three months and cleared this guy. And so he, he's now on more maintenance therapy, so he doesn't come in three times a week, and he's still clear and really, really, really happy. Pseudolymphoma, it's not lymphoma, but still it can be very disabling, uh, responds very well to higher concentrations of intralesional kenalog. Just after one session of 10 mg per cc, substantial improvement in symptomatology, but also in clinical appearance. Last but not least, have fun. You know, you could be paid all the money in the world, but if you dread going to work every day, it's not gonna matter. You know, you're gonna burn out. And I mean, there's so much discussion about burnout these days, but enjoying what you do and having fun is so central to that. And so there's some really easy ways to have fun as a team. One of the ways we do that is capturing the funny things patients say. And this is actually a list hanging up in our clinic. And so I wanna highlight some of the fun ones, like erectile bowel syndrome, the cervix of the scalp. And I highlight this one because this was actually one of my residents presenting a case to me. And he actually, it's great, his name is Thomas. He has this really kind of unique voice. He kind of sounds like this. And he says, Dr. Friedman, on the cervix of the scalp, Mike, Thomas, we should, we should revisit this. Carrot toasts for seborrheic keratoses. Erotic LP. Arthritis, my good friend, Arthur Ritus. Keylords, <laughs> for keloids. And assist, assist. The other thing I highly recommend doing is creating a meme board. There's a great app, I have no conflict of interest, called Mematic, where you can really have fun with photos. Uh, and we actually have a board in our MA room where we put all, these are actually the, the tamer ones. I'll, I, I felt some were probably inappropriate for this audience. Um, but uh, certainly you have a lot of fun with this and, and really share in that enjoyment and share in the stupidity that life has to offer because it's out there and we should really capture it and enjoy it. So with that, I appreciate your attention and I hope that was helpful. Thank you.